Happy Sunday, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 12 Faces of Sober Speaks podcast. This is episode 31. I got a good guest, just like any other one, but this one is special. We've been going back and forth, missing schedules as far as this. I think we've been trying to do this since like August. Yeah. Late August. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely glad that... Um, that we were, we're going to have this opportunity to have a conversation. Um, I got some surprise questions. I had to run a test by her just to see how the, the, the random questions are going to be and she passed. So I might pull out another one, but, um, I, as, as you guys know, uh, tomorrow or those that don't know tomorrow, I celebrate, uh, five years of being sober. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. So, so that, that's, that's the reason why I wanted you to come on before that. Huge congrats. Um, I uh, celebrate uh, celebrate five years, and I actually uh, got sober here in Minnesota. So it worked out perfect for me to leave warm Florida to freeze my behind off to uh, celebrate the five years. And I have a sale going on. Uh, you can click the link in my bios or on Linktree, uh, 12 Faces Sober. I have uh, hoodies on clearance for uh, $12. No, uh, T-shirts for... Um, for twelve dollars, hoodies for twenty. Um, I just added a variety of hats, snapbacks, and trucker hats on there. That's twelve faces of sober. My book, Twelve Faces of Sober, is available on my website, twelvefacesofsober.com. You can uh, click a signed copy, get that for twelve dollars, as well as you can get it on Amazon for twelve dollars or download it for ninety nine cents, uh, the ebook version. Um, and uh, I think that's it. As far as that, but uh, my guest, like I said, uh, Haley, um, she's she's uh, she's not only in recovery for uh, from alcohol, and she just celebrated uh, a year in three months. Well, it will be a year in three months sober on the twenty eighth. Um, I uh, you know wanted to have her on here as well because she's very outspoken, um, has no filter with uh, with Hi. her recovery. <laughs> and, and that's one thing that uh, I definitely want to talk about today, as well as um, she's a cancer survivor. So we're going to dive in, give her the opportunity to share a little bit about herself. And then I'm just going to start asking and asking and asking until she's tired of me. But uh, <laughs> like I said, thank you so much, Haley, for coming on. Welcome to the show. Um, and you have the floor. Thank you. Oh man. Thank you so much for having me, Kenneth. I'm super excited. Yeah. We went back and forth for a little while, so I'm really glad, um, that we got to do this. Um, yes, my name is Haley. I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. I'm from Washington, DC, but I live, um, about 20, 20 miles North in Northern Virginia. Um, and yeah, I'm a mom. I'm a mom full time. My son is with his father for the weekend, but I'm a full time mom. I work full time as an executive assistant. Um, contrary to what people think, I'm not on social media all day long, every day. I have a you know a nine to five, <clears throat> and I stay busy with that. And um, my son and my program. I'm very heavily involved in fellowship and service work, and um, you know. And any opportunity like this, um, I always say yes first, because my sponsor told me I need to always say yes. And, um, you know, second, because it's, um, it's, it's good for my recovery and being of service helps me, um, as well as someone else who may be struggling, someone who hears a story and something resonates with them, um, or someone who's examining their relationship with alcohol, you know, I'm always, I'm always happy to be of service. I'm really grateful to be here. So um, when, when did you uh, realize that um, it was a problem? So I, um, I've always been a party girl. I've always been someone who did everything in excess. I've always been a person who had literally like the break or just like full throttle. I had like nothing in between. I've always been, you know, the extreme one or the other. And, um, I, 
I've had small windows, very short windows of time throughout my history where I had like my act together, you know, like I was a student, um, I was a working professional, I was a mom and I really thought I had everything together. But, um, when things got really bad was, um, about two years ago and, I don't know where that invisible line that it talks about in the big book, um, where that line from just drinking recreationally um, and drinking socially turned into needing it um, in my system every single day and where it turned into uh, drinking first thing in the morning before I went to work and drinking during work and drinking in the middle of the night just to pass back out. I have really no idea when that happened, but, um, I, I did that for like a year and a half straight when, um, when it did start, I just didn't stop up until, um, I decided to get help. Um, and that was in August of 2020 that I, you know, I looked around and I was just broken and I didn't know what to do. Um, I didn't know where to go or how to get there. I just, um, I knew I couldn't live the way I was living anymore. I was going to lose everything. I was going to lose my son. I was going to lose my job. I did lose my job, but, um, they waited until, you know, after I sought help and, um, it was just really, really bad. It was really bad. And so, so was it, um, cause it, you know, one thing and it, and it, and it clicked into my mind because the, the last year of me, um, well, when I got out the army, I got out in 2015, but, um, that last year, that was my life in terms of waking up in the morning, wanting to drink, going to the store at lunchtime, you know, wanting, you know, getting a drink, drinking in the evening, drinking at night in the middle of the night. Was there something in your life that changed that, uh, made you, you know, increase the volume? You said you were a, a party person, but you know, was it something that like, you know, like for me, it was just adjusting to reality, but right. was it something that, that kind of got it, you know, got you to that point to where you, you know, you wanted or had to drink as often as you mentioned? Yeah, I think, um, it was like a culmination of my entire life. I think that, um, I, grew up, um, really fast because I didn't like listening to what anyone had to say. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. So I partied a lot during high school, I think in, and in my early twenties. And I think during all these times when you're supposed to be learning how to be an adult and how to be, um, you know, those coping skills and how to deal with life on life's terms, I didn't learn how to do any of that. So when life started getting lifey and I started, um, having relationships, um, one specifically with my son's father, that was very tumultuous. Um, and then our very bitter breakup in our custody, you know, war, it wasn't even a battle. It was a war that lasted like two and a half years. Um, me getting sick and diagnosed with cancer and having to deal with that while my son was an infant. I think that I did not have, I know that I had no skills with how to cope with any of that. So I was just on autopilot. I was pushing through it because I had to, because I mean, I, my parents are military. My mom's a retired, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel. My dad is a retired airborne ranger. And that was our military mentality. It was drink water and drive on. Like we did not discuss it. We just got, you just figured it out. You got over it and you got it done. And, um, I wasn't built like that. Not only was I not built like that. And I'm, am I an extremely sensitive person that has to process things on top of that? I never learned how to process anything because I never allowed myself to process anything or to deal with anything. Um, I pushed everything as far down as I could because I thought that's, you know, how I can be like everyone else in my family and just deal with things and get over it. Um, And when the dust settled with my son's father and it was just my son and I on our own to everyone else's eyes, I was doing all the things that I mean, I was going to work. I was getting all the professional accolades. 
I bought a new SUV. I never missed a soccer game or a practice. I was doing the damn thing, but like behind closed doors, when my son with our new arrangement with his father for visitation, when he wasn't around, I had no idea what to do with myself. The time that I had on my own, I was so lonely. I missed him so much. All I could do was sit around and think about like the hurt that I felt from the breakup with his father and like the devastation of my family falling apart. And like, it wasn't just that though, that was my turning point. That's when things got really, really bad. When my son started, when I had all this time on my hands and I didn't have a distraction anymore. Right. But it was just like, literally life just hit me all of a sudden in my mid thirties. And I just couldn't push everything, all the trauma, all the hurt, all the devastation, all the, um, all the ugliness that I'd been running from for so long. It was like, it just all hit me right in the freaking face. And I had no tools with how to deal with it. The only thing I knew was what I discovered when I was 15 years old, the second I put a bottle of vodka to my face and was like, Oh my God, I like this. This is what I've been looking for all my life. Like that is the only thing I knew. I knew that I did not like feeling my feelings. I knew that I did not know how to feel my feelings and I knew how to make my feelings go away. And that's exactly what I did every day, all day for a year and a half up until um, I decided it was enough. Wow, that's amazing. <clears throat> Cause that's that's that sounds oh so similar because and and I just wanted to share this with you because when I I got out to army uh August August of 20, uh, 2015 and I didn't want um to go back to work. I uh, I did six years, uh, got out on a medical um discharge, and I I wanted to just focus on going to school and um you know getting my master's degree. But those around me didn't want that. I, I was married, uh, well, previously married, and my uh, now ex-wife, she was like, no, you need to go to work. And I'm like, she don't know nothing about that GI Bill. She don't know that, you know what I'm saying, that, and, you know, how you qualify for all these things. And so it was like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to work. Went to work, but I, in my mind, I was still drinking. And it was like, I, I didn't want to you know, do the nine to five. I wanted to put my mind into something totally different and not an aspect of work. And so what ended up happening, I quit that job after five days, worked another job for like about a month and a half where I was uh, like, I worked for a nonprofit. And so I was like, oh, you know, I got celebrity connections. Yeah, I can bring us some money. I'm going home to get drunk because I I just, it, it felt like, okay, I'm I'm pleasing others, but not trying to, really focus on myself. And, and I had health issues to this day that I'm still dealing with. But at that time, they didn't want, you know, nobody wanted to hear that. Only thing they were like, we need you to bring some money in. And, and not realizing that the military can, has really messed up a lot of people. And I'm one of them, you know? Yeah. And um, so, but yeah, I, um, I, I wanted to think there was something as you were talking, I didn't want to interrupt you, but um, so, um, did, did anybody around you notice that you were like you were slipping into this or was it like you were saying that there were times where you were alone? Did So when you were around people, were anybody like like stepping in saying, hey, you might want to slow this down or you might want to seek some help? Was there anybody that was around you that was saying that? So um, that's funny because I. I thought I was very slick. I thought that um, I had a whole, the insanity uh, was um, that everyone in my family works hard and plays even harder. So I don't think anyone was too terribly concerned. I think everyone knew Haley had a rough couple of years and Haley is doing really well. Um, so she might just be going through something and this is a phase, but people definitely noticed that this phase was, was scary. Um, when I finally, I mean, I burnt every relationship I had down to the ground. I had no friends 
I had no friends when I finally turned it over and said, I need help. Um, so I don't think anyone was around towards the end to notice I had a problem. My family, on the other hand, after I had um, come out and said, I think I need help, they had expressed that they, they were scared that they, um, that they had noticed my behavior. Um, my dad had asked my boyfriend at the time, um, to do his best to watch over me because he was, he was frightened and he was stressed. I mean, I would call him totally blacked out, um, you know, freaking, I, I had no emotional regulation or control at all. So I would call my dad because that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a daddy's girl and I'm a brat and I don't know how to deal with anything. I was a 35 year old woman with the emotional intelligence of a 21 year old. Like I did not know how to deal with anything. You know, my whole thing was called daddy, just like I did in high school. You know, I never had any consequences for anything. Cause all I did was call my dad. He knew every cop in the County and they would just come get me. I never went, I mean, I never had any consequences and um, my dad said, you know, when I called him and said, I think I have a problem with alcohol and I think I need help. He was like, yeah, I know you have a problem. And I was like, really? And he was like, <laughs> he was like, yeah, he said, just like, he was like, yeah, I know you got a problem girl. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, you know, we've all just been like kind of watching and waiting for you to wake up and realize that like, this isn't something that like daddy can get you out of. This isn't something that like I can fix for you. And I was like, oh shit. I, I, and I had no idea, but, um, apparently everyone was just sitting around watching and kind of like terrified and waiting for, you know, this phase to go away. So my dad never confronted me about it. My sister was very concerned, but again, they felt, um, they knew I had a rough couple of years. I mean, like the amount of shit that I went through in a very short amount of time, I had a very traumatic delivery with my son. 11 days after him, I got diagnosed with cancer. My son's father was sleeping with my best friend while I was pregnant and going through chemo. And we had, and not only that, but he decided to drain me completely of all like deplete me completely financially, emotionally, spiritually dragging me in and out of court to fight for our son. When I wasn't even fighting him, he just wanted so much. It, it was unreasonable. I mean, you weren't there. I was raising our child. I certainly wasn't going to go let him live with you. I mean, I went through so much shit. There was no denying how much fucking shit it was hell for two years. And I think everyone felt really bad for me. And I took full advantage of that. I took full advantage of like, you have no idea what I've been through. This is what I need to do to survive and provide for my son. And as far as I'm concerned, it's none of your business and leave me alone. And I held everyone around me hostage with that, with them feeling bad for me, understanding that I'm going through a lot and I'm just you know, I took full advantage of that and it scared the hell out of everyone. It was, it was terrifying. You know, they didn't know what to do. They didn't want to like be angry because here is Haley trying her best. She's suffering and she's figuring this out. They didn't want to enable me. I mean, this disease, when they say it affects everyone, like it, it goes so much far past that, like the emotional toll I put on my, and I've been like that my entire life. Even as an adolescent, I, I held everyone hostage with my my inability to cope and be able to figure out how to deal with things. And um, it was just insanity. It was insanity. So so <clears throat> you mentioned uh, you mentioned, you know, having a conversation with your dad. So what was next after now you're, you're coming clean? You know, like I need to get the help. Did you go to rehab? Did you go to detox or did you quit cold turkey? So how, how, how was that process? So I tried to quit so many times my own before I understood powerlessness, before I understood that I had a disease and a spiritual malady and all these other jargony terms. I only learned once I stepped into the rooms of AA, I did not understand why I could not fucking do this. Like I've been able to do everything else. Like I grew up with the mentality that like, it's mind over matter, right? Like you're in the military, you were in the military, like you, you figure it out. Like no. And even my family didn't understand why I couldn't on my own will get over this and say no. And, um, I was so spiritually broken. I felt so ashamed of 
not being able to put this drink down. I felt like it meant like I didn't love my son and I didn't love, I knew I didn't love myself. I hated myself, but like, I, I mean, the spiritual toll it takes on your mental health. It's just, um, I hated myself. I didn't understand why I couldn't just put this down. I didn't understand why I could get past all these other things that happened to me in life, but I could not get over this. And I didn't understand powerlessness. I didn't understand that it wasn't a choice anymore. All I knew is that I was a piece of shit and that like, I deserved the amount of misery I was in because I was choosing to do this. And when I decided to get help, I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know I was an alcoholic or an addict. I thought I was just really stressed out. So I was like, you know, I'm going to go to rehab. I researched all these rehabs and I found a place. I was like, if I'm going to rehab, I want to go where like Lindsay Lohan or like somebody like I researched all these bougie ass rehabs. And I went to this beautiful place in South Florida. And when I got there, I was not okay with the situation. I was like, okay, these people are addicts and alcoholics. Like I'm not an ad, like I do not belong here. Like y'all have a problem. I do not have a problem. And I thought, I mean, even though I did all the, I mean, I planned my own intervention. I planned my own trip to rehab. I packed like I was going to Palm Springs and I was going to fucking detox. Like I, it was just insane insanity. Um, I had no idea what I was in. I was getting myself into And when I got there, I was like, I do not belong here. Like these people are the addicts. Like I am not an addict. And, um, I fought them for like 14 days. I was like, I don't understand why no one's listening to me. Like get my dad on the phone. I'm going home because I didn't think I belonged there. I was like, I'm just really stressed out. I have a lot of problems right now. I just, um, I thought I needed to go to rehab to hit a reset button. Mm -hmm. I had no concept of the disease of addiction. I did not understand the disease that I had. I did not understand that it was a disease. I thought addiction was like what the stigma tells us addiction is like people that are just weak minded and, um, can't get their shit together and make the selfish decision, uh, to do whatever gives them a short term feeling of, euphoria. I did not, I, I am guilty of that myself. And I did not understand that I had a disease until I surrendered. I was sitting in rehab and they were getting ready to move me over to a 30 day, which they had to fight me about. I was like, no, I just came here to detox. Now that I'm detoxed, I'm cured. I'm going home. And they told me that the idea was that I go on to 30 day treatment in a house with a bunch of other women. And like, I just, I couldn't understand. I didn't understand why they were fighting for this so hard. I was like, look, I am not like these people. I fought it so hard. And then it was on day 14 when I was in the shower at detox and a girl was doing her hair in the mirror. Cause there were so many of us in there and I was talking to her and I just started crying in the shower while she was doing her hair. And she, you know, asked me if I was all right. And I just thought in my head, it was just like clear as day. Every time I have put a mood or mind altering substance in my body I have never been able, there's never been a stop button. There's never been a pause button. I didn't finish high school. I got kicked out of one high school. I got kicked out of the other high school. I got my GED. I had been in, you know, more risky situations that I could count. I had short windows of time where I could keep my shit halfway together. But at the end of the day, I always leaned back on what I knew, which was getting fucked up to stop feeling. And it just hit me in the shower that I was an alcoholic. I was like, 
oh my God, like everything that they're talking about, that like obsession, that inability to stop, like, cause I didn't open up the big book. I didn't read any of that shit. I was like, I'm just here to do my time. And then I'm going home. And the second I had that shower and I, you know, I think that was my surrender moment. And I realized like, this was way bigger than me. Mm. I accepted to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic. And um, it was a moment, man. Like I was like, Ooh! I was like crying. And the next day um, I agreed to go to um, 30 day, you know, care. And I started taking all the group assignments and um, reading the book, the big book. And I just read my story page after page. It was like telling me everything I'd ever done, like all the shit we do as alcoholics and how we can be successful in all other areas of our life. But when it comes to this one thing, we just can't do it on our own um, self will. And I was just reading my, it, it was almost like everything like made sense. Like everything in my life made sense when I just like surrendered and um, I just haven't looked back since I, I've just been, I've been staying teachable and not telling myself that I got this figured out. Cause I can fucking do that. Like I can be like, Oh, um, I got this figured out. I'm so good at this, this recovery thing. And, um, it's just been a wild journey. I feel like the second I, um, I got into the rooms, I, I discovered like what, has been wrong with me. Um, why I could never just like, I just always felt different. I always felt like everyone got a manual, you know, born with them to life that I didn't get. And like, now I have this manual and I'm just like, so grateful for it. Mm. Big shots out to uh, Nova. <laughs> Big shots out. Reason why I say that, <clears throat> excuse me, because one of my rehab stints was at Fort Belvoir. So, yeah, I was uh, there in 2014. Um, That one was forced by the Army. So you already know the results. I I didn't. um, Well, I got sober two years later, you might as well say. But, yeah, so kind of as you were telling the story, I I thought about that. I mean, I will say that, you know, even with mine, like I said, I I did um, three stints of uh, rehab in different uh, cities and states before this last time uh, that I did here in Minnesota. And my my situation was a little bit different because it was like, you know, my mom, you know, I'm, I'm a mama's boy, not gonna lie, I'm the youngest, uh, youngest child. And, you know, my mom, she told me the, she didn't wanna bury her son or any of her kids. And and I think the night before, cause I think when I, when I came back from Arizona um, I, uh, in, in 2016, I had, you know, a little bit of money, so I didn't want my ex-wife to get any of it. So I was like, all right, I need to go to the casino and and gamble. You know, I'm an avid uh, poker player. And so that was like that was my outlet. That was my friend. And I remember like the next morning, my mom had like she knew I was still drunk and was like, what can I do to help you? I'll do whatever it takes. And um, and I was like, all right, I'll try it. But I didn't think. You know, because of the other times I went to rehab, I thought that I would be like right back after 30 days back out there drinking. And the reason why I didn't do it this time is because of all the stuff that was happening to me in rehab. You know, I um, I would like I said, was fortunate enough, uh, my, like my my car, my furniture and everything, because I took everything from my ex-wife. <laughs> I cleaned her out. But so I put everything <laughs> in storage and. And so uh, once I had got the money, um, I was like, you know what, let me just go ahead and get this stuff. And I told my mom, I was like, but I don't, you know, I want my car up here, but I don't want it at the rehab facility. And so I was like, I'll deliver it to your house and I'll get it. You know, you guys can come pick me up in it, you know, and that's what happened. And, and I was actually, I came home, I came down here um, for one day. And then they called me and were like, hey, your furniture is, you know, going to be delivered. So here it is. I'm fresh out of rehab alone. I had to drive back another hour uh, up in St. Cloud. I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with that city. But, I am. 
Um, my mom went to college there, yeah. Oh, I, I'm an alumni two times. <laughs> it's my world. But I, uh, so I went ahead and um, got out and was like, okay, I got to drive back up here. I got, like, I got my apartment the day I got out of rehab. And so it was like, all right, I could be in this apartment or I can go spend some time with my family. And then sure enough, they called, was like, oh, we want your, you know, your furniture. So here it is, I'm alone. And a day out, you know, after being out of treatment and not trusting myself, but I knew that, okay, I got accepted to grad school while in rehab. I got my car, I got my furniture. And now I'm knowing like, okay, maybe this might be something that I can do, but didn't think that I would, you know, say that it would go on this long. And so I, I salute you and I commend you for, for one, taking the step to like, you know what, saying enough is enough. And then to not only, you know, take on just, you know, going past the detox. And, and like I said, a lot of, a lot of us, who are out there that's still struggling doesn't get that opportunity to acknowledge that or that boiling point because we we all have similar boiling points of of the emotions and like you know what enough is enough because when I was in rehab I said it I said the last tears from my ex-wife I went through every single picture of her and was like she's off of my phone she's off my social media because I knew that that was one of the reasons that was pulling me down as far as the drinking. So I, I definitely commend you for sticking with it, going, going to treatment and, and working the program, because there are some people that work the program and then stop for whatever reason, but you kept going and, and you felt like, okay, my sobriety, my recovery process is more important. You know what I'm saying? Than whatever chaotic life I may have been living prior to. So uh, I commend you on that. You mentioned uh, uh, having cancer. Now you 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 mentioned a couple of things that I did not know. You so were you diagnosed with uh, the stage two lymphoma cancer first and then got pregnant, or was that after? It was after. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then so um, during that process, were you? still drinking or or you or you just kind of like was going through you know whatever treatment you had to go through and you cut that off or once you were completed with the, the cancer you started you know the picking up the drinking because I know you kind of mentioned a couple different things so I just wanted to make sure that I have it have yeah it. no it was kind of convenient I mean I did not drink of I shouldn't say of course because I know some women um you know have a disease that was significant and drank during their pregnancy, but I did not drink at all during my pregnancy. Um, and when I had my son, I had, um, something called a postpartum hemorrhage and it happens like one out of five pregnancies. And it's basically where you like, you know, you bleed to death. Um, your uterus doesn't stop contracting after you, um, deliver. And, um, they had to put me under and put me, um, into an emergency hysterectomy because I was like going into shock. I was like bleeding out. And, um, that was a really traumatic delivery. And they said, you know, your body's going to go through a lot of changes because you lost a significant amount of blood. Um, so I had a mass on my neck. I thought it was just like part of the process of my body recovering from all the blood loss of my delivery. I went in for imaging and that was, 10 days after I had my son. And then on the 11th day, um, they had an oncologist call me and tell me that I had stage two lymphoma, that I had a mass in my neck and that I had a mass in my lungs. And when my son was a month old, I underwent six months of chemotherapy to eradicate that malignancy. And it was convenient timing, I would suppose, because with my cocktail chemotherapy, I could not drink. I don't know what the hell the reason was. I could not drink, but I could not drink before the treatments and I could not drink after the fucking treatment. So that basically meant I couldn't fucking drink because there was like not a whole lot of time between before the treatment and after the like it made no sense i wanted to be like why don't you just say you can't drink the entire six months so i did have a cup but i was so ill 
um, I really didn't have any um, desire to eat or drink anything other than mashed potatoes and bread and like comfort food. So it was, um, and I didn't plan on drinking because I was going to be breastfeeding. I wasn't able to breastfeed because I was undergoing chemo, but, um, it just worked out perfectly. That was right after my delivery because, um, I couldn't drink and I was already not drinking for nine months. I didn't have any desire to drink. And, um, I didn't, feel any pull to drink during chemo because nothing tasted or sounded good at that time. So no, I, I was compliant with those orders. Um, but it was more so, um, because if I really wanted to drink, I would have drank, but I, I did not find any desire in doing, doing that during treatment. All right. And I salute you for, uh, for being the cancer survivor and sharing that. I, like I said, I didn't know um, the, the severity, but I, I do appreciate um, the fact of you sharing. And that's one thing that, like I said, I, I, I liked about, you know, following or following your page itself because you are an open book. You, you, you don't have a problem with sharing. Um, and, and, and that's, that's a, a difficult thing to do is because you're, you're sharing personal information that, you know, some people try to, like you said, you, you pushed it, you, you pushed a lot of those, those things down, or, or as you say, in, in a box into where you just did not want to, to anybody to know. So I, I commend you for that. And um, this is one of those random questions. I know we're getting uh, close to the end, but so here now, now that I'm here in Minnesota and I'm cold now, does the weather affect your recovery process at uh, all? No, I, uh, it hasn't. This is no, it's, um, no, I mean, I, I don't want to put on pants more than I have to usually when it's cold out, but no, I, 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 I still get to my meetings. I still fellowship with my ladies. No, I, and you can zoom meetings all day long. So no, it hasn't had any, any issue for me. Okay. Yeah, it, it affected me, like I said, because I've been spoiled with not <laughs> having winters for the last two years. And I think the it snowed yesterday. And like I said, I, you know, I'll call my family and, and talk all kind of trash. But I sure didn't think I was coming back. So it, it, it affected my mood because, like I said, I'm so used to to waking up with this beaming sun, regardless of what yeah. time of year it is. So it, it kind of. It, it altered my mood slightly, but I had to bring myself to reality because like I said, I've lived here, you know, I've been living in Minnesota off and on since 2000. Yeah. So, but that's cool. So, um, the, uh, let me see, had like, since, since you've, uh, you know, been sober now a little over a year, have there been any type of, um, like hobbies that you've picked up since getting sober or find difficult? like through the recovery process. And, I, and I'll give you an example. Like I, I'm, a, I'm a big sports fan. I, I do fantasy football. I used to do fantasy basketball. But during the time of my heavy drinking, it was always with some type of sport. I'm watching football. I'm watching basketball. And I had to separate, you know, you know make a decision. Which one do I want to watch more? And, you know, which one can I stomach more? And it obviously was football. And, and, and so that was, and it's hard. Cause like my buddies will call me now and be like, Hey man, did you hear about LeBron James did this and blah. I'm like, man, look, I don't watch basketball until like the end of the season because it's just the, the constant reminders of alcohol and, you know, and it's on every single time they, they go to commercial and, and I just, it's, it's overwhelming you know, per se. So I guess my question to you is that have you, have you picked up anything or noticed like, oh, OK, this may have been something I might have been interested in. But now that I'm at a you know different mindset, now I can actually do it. Because I noticed I saw something about you riding horses, I think, in Texas. So mm -hmm. I was just curious, like, was that something you were doing before or that's just something that, you know, you may have just picked up? Um, I've been riding horses off and on since high school um, in northern Virginia. Um, a lot of my way more rich friends have boarded horses. Um, that's something I do when I travel more cause there's nowhere really around here, um, to do that. But 
Um, not so much anymore. There's nothing I really picked up. I mean, I started fishing again, which I enjoyed. And that was a huge, um, that was a huge drinking activity. Um, it took me a while to pick up that again. And even that I still am inching my way into, I started longboarding again, didn't do that much, like not a huge drinking activity, but I drank to do anything. Um, I had a really hard time in early recovery. I didn't, I didn't cook or go into my kitchen for like two months when I got home from rehab, because it was just like a huge trigger. Cause I was never cooking or in the kitchen without alcohol in my hand, like ever. And, um, I actually did a piece with like a recovery mom on here, the sobriety activists about how I, you know, had to have that sober support network and call people every time I felt triggered in those moments where I wanted to go in my kitchen and make a damn meal. But like, I could literally like feel my, my, my glands, like salivating. Like I just, it was like this, this response I couldn't control. (laughs) Um, so I've, I've been okay so far. Um, I, I, I can coexist with alcohol. Now I can go places where there's alcohol. I can, I don't go to bars and frequent them, but like I can go, um, out to restaurants. I wasn't able to do that when I first got out, I was extremely triggered by that. Um, I'm still learning what I'm into. Um, I haven't done anything but drink and work and be a mom for a long time now. And I'm still learning like what feeds my soul and like what I enjoy doing. And, um, every day, you know, I learn a little something new. So. Okay. And, um, I got, I got a couple more things and we're going to wrap it up. Um, I, I was going to say this for the end, but I wanted to, um, to, to do it now, but, um, you, you had a quote on one of your posts, She's strong, resilient, anything but normal, but she's at peace. That is only because I chose recovery, not sobriety, recovery. I like, I, I love that post. I love that quote because it, it took me a while to be at peace because of just all the trauma that I endured and And that's what stuck out to me. And and I was like, okay, yeah, this is like confirmation validation for me because I was angry. I I despised my ex-wife and her family and and all of this because I was left homeless and everything and was able to pick myself up from it. And and you're just like that too. You, You had your triumph. You've you have overcame odds and you're you're now at peace and and you're able to speak about it and help the next person that may not be able to you know you know have the knowledge of the experience or you know someone like yourself this is raw and uncut and 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 that's what what to me is that i've learned is that I honestly had to be at peace with um, with a lot of different things. I had to put stuff in the past from growing up with my father and, and just not him being a dad, you know, type of thing or being in the military, you know, life. And so, but yeah, so I wanted to um, definitely um, acknowledge you on that because that that is that is real deep. And um, so I wanted to point that out. And um uh, now, like I said, my, my podcast um, is all about, um, you know, getting people on, you know, I, I do entrepreneurs, professional athletes, um, but the most important thing is hearing other people that's in recovery, their stories, because I can get on here, hit record every day, and I can go down and tell the story, but I don't want to do that. I want others to come on because our story, our stories are similar, but they're unique within their own right. And your story is definitely unique. And so that's why I wanted to say thank you for coming on. And I I really appreciate it because, you know, especially with, uh, like I said, my five year uh, sober celebration, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow, but at least I know that my weekend is complete. 
and and I'm sharing, you know, having a conversation with someone that's also in recovery. And hopefully um, I can be some type of an encouragement to, you know what I'm saying? If we can talk in four years when you get to five years, you know what I'm saying? Cause, cause that's what it's all about is that I'm not just doing these shows and making these relationships. Now I want those relationships to continue with, you know, years to come. Absolutely. So I want to say uh, thank you with that, but here's the last random question and then we're done. Hit me. Oh, best spot in DC for smoke barbecue. D City Smokehouse. Okay, where is that? It's um, it's off Florida Avenue in Washington D.C. and it's so good. It's really, really good. I haven't been in in quite a while. Now I feel like I have to make a trip into the city and do this thing. Because I don't remember the name of the place I went to. I just know that it was near. Um, it was around the corner from, uh, like some consulates. And like the consulates was on the main street or whatever. And then you had to turn on some street. And I just know that they wrote their menu on a brown piece of paper. Oh, that's how you know it's good. Yeah. I'm trying to think, um, I'm trying to think who that could be. I know Rockland's is down there. I have no idea, but I like D City Smokehouse. That's my okay. yeah. that's the jam. I, w- I was upset because there were certain things on the menu that, you know, if you don't get there early enough. Oh, yeah. You're not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was I was upset, but I, I did get the chicken wings, definitely. Ooh. But um, I just wanted to uh, oh oh one last thing. Yes. If you have one message that you can leave, um, my my listeners, my followers, um, that's still out there struggling, that's still fighting those demons not listening to family, um, not listening to their heart. Like what advice would you give them to that would, you know, you, you have, you know, you have some time under your belt. And I'm not saying to be a sponsor, but I'm just saying like, if you had to truly give some, you know, somebody some advice, what would it be? My advice would be, um, I know that you feel like no one could ever understand what you've been through or I know you can't understand or you can't see what life outside of where you are and beyond where you are right now could even imagine what that would look like, but that um, it gets better and we get better, but um, you cannot do it alone. Um, It's scary. It's terrifying to think about changing. It's terrifying to think about doing this and getting our shit together, but we're dying and you have to, and you can't do it alone. Reach out to me, reach out to Kenneth, reach out to anyone on my friends list. Um, It doesn't matter what state, what time zone, what day of, or time of night it is. Um, We take care of each other in recovery and you don't have to do this alone. All right. Haley, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank thank you you so much. I learned some more about you that I didn't know before I hit the record button. (laughs) Um, But I appreciate it. You know, I, like I said, I'm I'm still a student in this recovery process and I want to learn and and talk to good, good people like yourself. And, you know, just kind of build off of that and, you know, whatever steps and keys to keep us sober, I guess, is what's most important. Yes. And, um, but, yeah, I, I truly thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being honest. Thank and I'm a cuss. You did the damn thing. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate it. And like I said, it's not a matter of how many times we missed these appointments is that we actually got a chance to do it. So Absolutely. Thank you. And I appreciate you. Too. Thank no you. Thank you, Kenneth. And happy five years. That's so exciting. Congrats. I appreciate it. And, and, and keep pushing out the, the positive content. I'll be watching. I'll be commenting. And like I said, we're, we in this thing together. So, yes. so like I said, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day, ladies and gentlemen, you guys can, uh, 
not only uh, get um, this, I'm, I'm switching over. I'm going to start having this stuff on Spotify and everything. I just, I've been trying to keep my feet planted with all the, the changes going on in my life, but it will be up soon. And like I said, um, like I said, 12 phases sober.com click the link tree in the bio. You can type in 12 phases sober. I got a whole lot of merch, whole lot of deals, whole lot of sales going on. And like I said, this is 12 phases sober speaks podcast episode 31. Haley, once again, thank you. You've been great. And uh, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, cool. Oh, did I stop it? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's see.